The Portsmouth uh, Redevelopment Housing Authority uh, PRHA Board of Commissioners uh, meetings are held the third Thursday of each month at five o'clock, and that's why we're here. All meetings are conducted at PRHA's main office, uh, uh, 3116 South Street, Portsmouth, Virginia, unless otherwise noted. All members of the public are welcome to attend. We haven't been out in a, in a couple, three months. Can, can, we, can you possibly look at taking us off site next month? Uh, I know we've been to Phoebus, we've been to Lexington, we've been to the Seaboard. So uh, wherever you can find a place that can accommodate yourself. Okay. All right. Uh, Ms. Marshall, why don't you call, uh, do the roll call, please? Yes. Commissioner Cost. Commissioner Pickens. Here. Commissioner Prince. Commissioner Wicks. Here. Commissioner Wright. Here. Vice Chair Jiggets. Here. Chair Lalonde. Here. And. Uh, Okay. <laughs> uh, before we get to the minutes and then uh, Cindy, I'm probably going to right after that, I'll pass it to you and then we'll go on with the rest of the business. But I would like to introduce our newest uh, commissioner, uh, Stephanie Wright, coming to us. Uh, in fact, she was with us at the, our training this morning, so this afternoon. So thank you very much for taking the time and the rest of the commissioners there. Thank you for taking time out of your day and, and, uh, and participating in that uh, discussion. I thought it was I thought it was great. I thought it was good that we had the time to get together with each other. But Stephanie, if you don't mind, just taking a minute or two since the staff is here, kind of say a few words about yourself and, and introduce yourself. Well, most of the staff know me. <laughs> uh, and then we all met, but for the purpose of everyone else, um, I'm Stephanie Wright. I am a citizen of Portland, of course, and I work for Chesapeake Housing Authority. I'm a director of the Section 8 program there and have been uh, going on 27 years. Uh, plan to retire here soon, too, so. Uh, but I look forward to serving on the board. I'm sure I'll be an asset. It's great having you here. Thank you very much. And uh, well, I've asked uh, I've asked Ms. Wright to sit with the development okay. committee. Mm -hmm. So Philip, I guess you'll have that discussion mm -hmm. with her as we, as we go down the committee assignments. Uh, okay, well, you should have in front of you or should have received the uh, minutes from the April 14th meeting. We did not have a, a May meeting. Uh, so April 14th, and I'll take a motion for approval of those minutes. I make a motion for approval. Second. So uh, motion and probably seconded. So if we could uh, take a, a vote, uh, Ms. Ms. Marshall. Commissioner Cross. Yes. Commissioner Pickens. Yes. Commissioner Prince. Yes. Commissioner Wick. Yes. Commissioner Wright. Yes. Vice Chair Jiggets. Yes. Chair Lalonde. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, I know Mr. Bland and I have had uh, several conversations in the last uh, couple months, and I know. Uh, those of us who attended the uh, conference down in San Antonio, it became obvious, it's becoming more and more obvious that uh, we are definitely at the cusp of a lot of things that are happening in housing. And uh, uh, RED, RED and MTW are the two things that you commissioners have, have really uh, kept your finger on the pulse and, and, and again, helped us go through the cycle that we need to where we're at. And uh, uh, I gotta tell you, in San Antonio, there was a lady that gave a briefing about red and I, I got to tell you, she might as well talk Greek to me. I mean, she was way out there on, uh, on fi the type of financing that's necessary that can be available for red. And I thought we, we've never got to that detail, nor that I, am I looking to go into that detail. But uh, I asked that if he could uh, set aside some time for us at, at our next meeting. And, and of course, Cindy has been uh, mm -hmm. with us through this, uh, you know, with us and partnered with us, sponsored us, mentored us all along the way of both those programs, MTW. And, uh, and I, I sincerely appreciate you getting us approved for that program, uh, Cindy. Without you and, and your mentorship, I don't think we would have had the application approved, let alone compete and win, win, the, uh, win the application for one of the cohorts. So thank you. And then, of course, I think we talked that you're going to talk a little bit about RAND, too. Um, there'll be a million questions. There really will. And don't feel like, hey, you know, that you're, you're by yourself here. This is where our future is at, though. And uh, as best as we can be familiar with what Mr. Blaine is doing, because the staff is definitely, definitely drilled into it. But if we're going to support them, we need to make sure that at least we, we at a 30,000 foot level, we know what we're talking about. So, Mr. Blaine, I don't know if you want to say anything before you bring the video. No, I think you, you did it very well. I'm going to pass it on to Sydney. Sydney um, is an expert. She worked with <laughs> many, many housing authorities across the country, giving them. Uh, uh, directions on RAB as well as MTW. So at this point, I'm going to let Cindy. Great. Oh. Hey, before you. you give it to Cindy, 
for the benefit of those who might be tuning in, because you know, Housing Authority loves to use the acronyms. Let everybody know what RAD stands for. Please. RAD is Renter Assistance Demonstration right. Program. Yep. And, so move, and MTW work. is Moving to Work Program. Thank you. <laughs> Where do you have the plugged in at? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, great. We're at another pivotal moment in our moving to work, and it's a very exciting one because we're getting ready to actually kick off some implementation. We went down the road, we were successful, and so now we're going to get ready to do some implementation. So I'm going to hopefully let's see if I can <coughs> make this work. <laughs> it's not, yeah. There we go. Okay, click it with the mouse. Okay. Um, first of all, just to kind of remind ourselves of the vision that we created for moving to work when we first started um, applying for the program is to uh, ensure that low and moderate income individuals in our community, regardless of their economic status, have good choices in where they live and the opportunity to reach their fullest potential. So that's our vision for where we want to go with our moving to work program. Moving to Work has three statutory goals, and anything that we do under Moving to Work has to comply with one of these three statutory goals. The first is to reduce the cost in administering the federal housing programs, provide incentives for the families to become self-sufficient, and expand housing choice for the families that we serve. So all the activities and everything that we do has to tie back to one of these statutory um, goals. So here's our year one. We have a very aggressive year one. These are all of the activities that we have put into our um, MTW supplement plan, which is what you have before you to approve tonight. Um, these are the activities that we're gonna undertake. The numbers aren't because we don't know sequential numbering, it's because HUD gives us those numbers. So, uh, so they're not necessarily sequential. They refer back to the, the, the different things you can do under MTW. So I'm going to start first with our stepped rents because that's the cohort that we were actually approved under. One of the cohorts that HUD put forth in expanding the MTW program is that they want to be able to look at alternate ways to calculate tenant rent. And we were selected under what's called the stepped rent provision. And so there's certain things that we have to do under that provision of stepped rents. And there's going to be a six year study in which HUD will study the way in which these rents are going to be calculated. The, the purpose of the of the stepped rents is really to look at different ways to calculate tenant rent, but more importantly, to provide incentives for the families to be able to increase their income without necessarily being penalized by having to pay more rent, which in turn theoretically should move the families towards self-sufficiency more quicker. It also is intended to reduce the cost to administer the program. There's a lot of administrative burden in these programs right now. And so HUD is looking for ways to make it a little simpler. And as I mentioned, it's gonna be under study by HUD. HUD has hired third party entities that are actually doing a very formal study of this process. And so a lot of the things that we have to do have to comply with statistical sampling and some of the requirements for the study itself. So let me talk about what the step rents will do. First of all, what it will do is it will create a rent for the tenants that is not tied to their income. It, um, we have always tied rent to income in the housing programs. Everyone has for many, originally it was 25% of their income. Many years ago, it went to 30% of income. The rent is gonna be a fixed amount regardless of what the family's income is, but it will be based on bedroom size and there will be a temporary hardship available for families that might be experiencing a hardship throughout this process. I'm going to talk more specifically about that. This is an example of how we're going to do the stepped rents. Basically, we're using the current HUD published fair market rents, and then there will be a percentage of increase each year, regardless of what your income is. So for example, somebody living in a two bedroom unit will get a rent increase of $36 a year. Regardless of what their income is, they're simply going to increase the tenant portion of the rent by $36 a year. And then it's done. For each bedroom size. Question. Yes, ma'am. With that, 
example you have there, mm -hmm. is all of that expense going to be borne by the family or is there going to be a certain amount of it that HUD will take care of? The bottom line where you see the increase per year, uh -huh. that's the dollar amount that the tenant's increase will increase each year. So the tenant will only pay $36? No, they'll pay. That's why I'm, I'm going to show you that in a minute. Their rent will increase by $36. Then I so if, the when they come on the program today, if 30% original, it's going to start out with the traditional rent calculation. So if their traditional rent calculation, meaning 30% of their monthly adjusted income is $100, they're going to pay $100 for that first year. The second year, they, if they live in a two bedroom, their rent will go to $136 regardless of what their income does. If they live in a three bedroom, their rent would go to $150. And I have some more examples that I'll show you in a little bit how that's gonna work. Okay, so then what you have up there for the one bedroom, two, three, four, five, mm -hmm. that's not really what they will be paying. That will be the increased amount that they will right. pay each year, correct? No, I'm not talking about, I'm talking about that, for example, maybe I'm not clarifying. Oh, the top yeah. is the fair yeah. market rent. Yeah. Okay, okay. yeah, and Thank what you. you see on the second line is three percent of that fair market rent okay so it's okay. gonna it's three percent that's what's that's what's driving it okay okay it could okay. be anywhere between two and four percent and we pick the midpoint of three percent okay okay right. yeah and it'll be a little clear in a few minutes here okay now there are some households that are excluded from the step rent study okay those households include elderly households that's anyone whose head co-head or spouse are 56 years of age or older it's all the special purpose vouchers, the bash vouchers, the enhanced vouchers, foster care, emergency housing. All of those are special vouchers and they meet a special need. Any disabled household or a household that's not or a household that may not be classified right now as disabled, but they've applied for disability or they have an application pending. And any household that's currently at zero housing assistance payment. There are families that go to zero right now and they stay on the program for six months. So at the time that we launch this, if somebody's at zero, they would be excluded from this because they'll be going off the program shortly thereafter. Okay, so what, what HUD is going to do then is they're basically going to have two groups of people that they study throughout this study process. There's going to be the standard group and there's going to be the study group and it's going to be randomly selected. So we're going to take all of our families, we're going to take all the people that are exempt and that I showed in the previous slide, okay, and then we're going to come up with the group that is not exempt. From that group that is not exempt, HUD is actually going to randomly select those. And some of them are going to be put into the study group and some of them will be put into the standard group. The standard group is going to pay their rent based on the standard rules, the ones we've been using forever. The study group is the group that's going to be paying the stepped rents. So that's basically the way that it'll be done on random selection. So here's an example of how it would really work. Once they're randomly selected for the first year, their rent will be calculated based on the standard formula. But the second year, their rent will automatically increase. So what I've done is I've shown an example in year one through six. In the first year, if someone has an annual adjusted income of $15,000 under the standard rent formula, 30% of their monthly income, their rent would be $375 before the utility allowance. Under the step rent, they're gonna pay the same amount the first year. When we get to the second year, Say somebody gets their job, they get an increase, and their income is now $17,500. Under the standard rent, they would pay $438. But under the stepped rent, this is a two-bedroom family, so their rent's only going to go up to $30, so they would go to $411. And so this just gives an example. If you go to year six, if by year six somebody now is making $30,000, instead of paying $750 that they would have paid under the standard calculation, under the step rent, they're only going to pay $555. So again, the, the driver behind this is to be able to allow the families to know what their rent is going to be, number one, and number two, to go out and secure more income, get better jobs, secure more income, and be able to pay a lower rent amount. And so that's an incentive for self-sufficiency and to provide the families with an incentive to be able to get more income. So that's basically the way it will work is through that process. Now, what happens when somebody's income goes, well, let me talk a little bit about the additional provisions. There will continue to be a minimum rent at $50. That's what it is now. They will continue to get a utility allowance. And if they receive utility assistance because their allowance is greater than their rent, they will continue to receive that. 
but they will go to triannual recertifications and those recertifications for the people in the step grant group will be only for the purposes to determine that they're still eligible. It won't impact their, the recertification won't be done to determine what their rent is because they're on that step rent. Um, and then if their incomes exceeds 120% of the AMI at the triennial, then they're no longer going to be eligible for the program, but they still get that six month window like they do right now when they go to zero assistance. So if I come in for my triennial recertification, my income's gone <coughs> above 120%, then I'm no longer eligible for the program, but I have a six month window before I actually go off the program. Um, and then interim recertifications will only be done if the owner requests a rent increase or if there's a change in the family size. Otherwise, we don't do interims. They don't have to report an increase in income and we don't do interim changes. We don't do interims if there's a decrease either. They have to apply for a hardship, which I'm going to talk about in a few minutes. So there's okay. no penalty in that six months. No, nope, there's no penalty for six months. Um, once they reach the 120%, they stay on the program for six months. That's just kind of to give them a cushion. If they were to lose their job, they could then come in and ask for a hardship, and then they would continue to be eligible for a longer period of time. So it's kind of a kind of a, a, a security cushion for the tenants to continue to be able to have some security. Well, thus far, this seems like this is uh, more favorable for the tenants. That's what they're coming out with. And I guess we can also attribute that to Marsha Fudge, who is the secretary of HUD and is also a Delta. I just thought I'd throw that in there. <laughs> um, so if somebody's rent goes down, there are some hardships they can request. They do not automatically get a decrease in rent under this program, okay? okay. But they can request a hardship. And there are basically three types of hardships they can get. There's a child care hardship. This is for a family that has child care in excess of $2,500 per year. The child care costs are deducted from their gross income and the rent would be recalculated at the beginning of their step. But they're only allowed to request that hardship twice throughout the six year period. So they can't request it all the time. It's a, it's a, it's a twice as all they get in the six year period, okay? The second hardship they can request is what's called a high rent burden hardship. This is if the step rent becomes more than 40% of their income. The tenant must come in and they must request that hardship. It's not automatic. It has to be requested and it has to be in writing. It is a temporary hardship that does not exceed 90 days. And at the end of that period, they must reapply. But then we have something called a sustained hardship. This is if somebody has a hardship condition that continues for 12 consecutive months. At that point, the review committee, there's going to be a hardship review committee that's required. It will determine on a case by case basis that their step rep will be reset. So let's say they're on step five, they're in year five and they've reached step five. They may get set back to step two or step three to decrease their rent if they have a sustained hardship. And it will be a committee that evaluates this of the staff and makes those determinations. Basically, their new step rent would be set at TTP. It would be the higher of the minimum rent or 30% of their prior year adjusted income. And then that would apply for 12 months and they get a new, a new basis for their step, depending on where they are at that point in time. So these are the three hardships that somebody can apply for. But the intent again, is to let the families know how much their rent is going to be. And it remains constant. The families don't have to guess how much is my rent gonna be. They're gonna know if my rent's $100, next year it's gonna be 130. The next year it's gonna be 160. They're gonna know in advance how much their rent's gonna be. So it's really gonna be very helpful to the families because they can plan better. They know what their rent's gonna be and they're gonna have an opportunity to go out and earn income and not have to pay more rent, which is gonna really help them. Yes, sir. So with Let's say COVID or monkeypox, if yeah. it goes where it's looking. <laughs> I'm, I'm just saying, would that be a sustained hardship? It could be. It depends on what the circumstances are. HUD would, something of that nature, the federal government would give us guidance on whether it is. But a sustained hardship would be somebody who um, got injured on the job and they can't work for a period of time. And their workers' comp is much less than what they might have been making in wages. And they know they're not going to be able to go back to work for 12 months. Okay, that would be more of the type of sustained hardship where they had a major operation. Most of it would be medical types of reasons more than anything, more than likely, barring a natural disaster or another pandemic or something of that sort. So that would be a sustained hardship. So, okay, any questions on the stepped rent? That's kind of a, a high level overview of what the stepped rent is going to look like. 
Let's talk about our other activities that we're going to be doing this year under MTW then. An alternate utility allowance. This is um, basically gets back to more cost-effective operations of the program. Right now we have multiple utility allowances. If I live in an apartment or a duplex or a single family home or a mobile home or whatever I live in, I have a different utility allowance. The alternate schedule is gonna allow us to have a single utility allowance based on your bedroom size. Again, this will be much easier for the landlords and the tenants to understand and know how much that utility allowance is. <laughs> the payment standards, we're very excited about this one. You know, rents have gone up all over the country astronomically, I mean significantly, and our voucher holders are having a real hard time finding places to rent because the payment standards have not kept up with the pace of the rents. So under moving to work, we will be able to go up to 150% of the small area fair market rents. And in fact, we will be creating our own primary market areas. We'll have a market analyst who's gonna come in and work with the authority and determine within the city of Portsmouth, how many market areas really are there with different rents. And we'll establish payment standards based on the real real estate market and not some random number that HUD comes with out of the, yes, Ed. Just let know that right now we're going to go up to 100. 110% is all you can go to right now. So this is a significant advantage that should hopefully help our families quite a bit. Um, rent reasonableness, this is something that we have to do to determine that the rents are in fact reasonable. Um, and right now we cannot do rent reasonableness if we happen to own the property. Under MTW, we'll be able to do that. So this will give us an opportunity to do that. The alternate recertifica recertification schedule, I touched on that. The, um, the folks that are in the rent study, um, the, the stepped rent, they will automatically be triennial, but we're also going to go to triennial for all of our families, regardless. We will go to triennial recertifications. Again, that will reduce workload on staff. Um, Self-certification of assets. Right now, the staff spends so much time collecting bank accounts that have $5 or $10 or $20 in them. Under MTW, we will get rid of all of that and we will not have to verify any assets unless they're 50,000 or more. Anything under that will be the family filling out a certification that says I don't have any assets that are greater than $50,000. And so again, that will save an incredible amount of staff time and on the families as well. It's to happen to chase down all their bank statements for the last three months. So um, HQS inspections, we're going to, oh, I'm sorry, I missed the landlord incentives. Landlord incentives, very important. Um, we are allowed to provide incentives to landlords. So we've, we've elected to say that we're going to provide an incentive for any landlord that's not currently participating in the voucher program. We will give him a one month bonus if he signs a HAP contract. So he'll get two months payment that first month instead of just one based on, he'll get up to one full month rent as, as a bonus to sign on. Again, that's a, a way to try to get landlords who may not want to participate in the voucher program excited and wanting to participate in it. <laughs> HQS inspections, we will be able to conduct inspections on our own properties now, um, as long as we have a supervisor that does some quality control. And we're going to go to triennial inspections as well. So we'll do inspections every three years, which also will be kind of an advantage and a cost saving measure. Um, project based voucher program. This is very important on our development programs in particular because we use project based vouchers to help develop new housing. Um, we'll be able to increase our program cap to 50%. Right now, that's limited to 20%. Under moving to work, we will go up to 50%. Our project cap, how many project based vouchers we can put in a single property. Right now, we can only do 100% if the housing is elderly or disabled, or we have some kind of special services. Under moving to work, we'll be able to go up to 100% in any project um, if we choose to do so. We eliminate any type of a selection process. If we own the properties, we can just basically give project-based vouchers to ourselves under MTW. And we will limit choice mobility to 24 months. Right now, it's a 12 month. That means somebody living in a project-based voucher property, at the end of 12 months, they can request a tenant-based voucher. We're going to extend that to 24 months. It gives a little bit more stability to those project-based properties, particularly the ones that we own, um, if families stay there for two years before they go on and request a, a move. Um, our FSS program, we're going to switch that up a little bit, and we're going to call it, in our original application, we referred to it as our Family Independence Initiative. Um, it basically will replace the traditional FSS program but for those families that are currently on the FSS, they will be able to choose to stay with the current FSS program or move to the new MTW um, independence initiative. What this program will do is rather than calculating an escrow based on changes in their earned income, it will actually pay them a specific amount for goals that are accomplished. 
So there'll be a schedule that says if you get your GED, you get X number of dollars. If you get an associate's degree, you get X number of dollars. So it will be drip, it will drive their goal accomplishment versus just driving their income. And so it'll be geared much more towards that. They will get paid out their escrow as they do now. It'll be upon graduation. And we've defined in our supplement that graduation will be six months of consecutive employment and the family's no longer receiving any type of TANF payments. So that's what graduation will be. And so that'll be a little bit of change in our FSS program. Development program, this is very exciting. We can use up to 10% of our voucher money. One of the big things about MTW you know, for years we've been told you can't commingle funds, you can't commingle funds. Well, now we're in MTW, we get to commingle all our funds. <laughs> so all of our funds go into what's called an MTW block grant, our Section 8 money, our public housing money, our capital funds. Um, any of our HUD money basically goes into a block grant. We're, we're able to use up to 10% of our housing choice voucher budget to do development activities for secondary financing. So that's really going to help us with some of our development projects as well. And then finally, another um, activity is the alternate verification hierarchy. Right now, HUD has like six different steps that you have to follow to verify somebody's income. We're going to simplify that. We're going to use HUD's EIV system, which we're required to use. Then we're going to use either a written or an oral third party. And then we're going to allow tenants to self-certify to their income. Just again, to kind of simplify it both for the clients as well as for the housing authority to be able to administer these programs. And finally, our home ownership program. We're looking at doing an MTW home ownership program instead of the traditional Section 8 home ownership program. This will basically provide a secondary form of financing or a soft mortgage, which will allow the family to qualify for a mortgage at a lesser amount than what the house cost. And we will bring in a second mortgage for these amounts based on the income of the family. And that will be forgiven at 10% a year. So if they live in the house for 10 years, it'll be fully forgiven and they'll be able to accumulate equity by purchasing a home. So that's a, another thing that we're going to do so under MTW. Yes. The area of AMI is? Um, area median income. So if they're between 50 and 70%, they have to be at least 50% to be eligible because they've got to qualify for a mortgage still, some form of a first mortgage. And then we'll provide up to $40,000 to help assist them with purchasing that home. Other questions? Yeah. Did you have a comment? Yeah. And the good and the good thing about you doing that is because if you were to take a a a, third, a fifteen year mortgage and then let's say the other half was uh five hundred dollars, which is six thousand a year, fifteen years, we would have paid ninety thousand dollars. This way we're saving the agency fifty grand. Right. And we can use that to help other families. Exactly. All right, so along with MTW, we're going to talk about our remaining real estate portfolio that is in the public housing program. So this is what we still have left in the public housing program today. We have the three Westbury properties, Holly Pine and Cottages, and we have Seaboard 1 and 2 that are still sitting in the, in the public housing portfolio. So part of moving to work will be taking those properties out of the public housing portfolio. The advantage that we have as an MTW agency, we have these tools that HUD has given us, but we can couple our MTW initiatives on top of the tools that HUD has given us, and it's going to make it a little easier for us to be able to remove these properties from public housing. Why do we want to remove them from public housing? Because HUD has not funded the public housing program at 100% of its eligibility for many, many, many years. It's probably been well over 20 years where on an annual basis, Congress appropriates money to fully fund the Section 8 programs, but they do not fully fund the public housing program. And so that's one of the main reasons. And the second main reason is that um, public housing is always funded at a much lower level per unit. Mm -hmm. So you simply don't have the money to maintain or create reserves for public housing. The program was never designed to think about replacement reserves. And so you just don't know from year to year what kind of money you even have to manage these properties. So we're going to move them out of public housing and move them to a Section 8 platform. We're going to do that using some tools. This is kind of what I call the HUD toolbox. HUD is really encouraging housing authorities to get out of the public housing program because they know that it's not being funded at a level that can sustain it. And so they've given us this box of tools. And so the first one I'm going to talk about is RAD because that's the big tool that HUD is really pushing and wants everybody to use. RAD actually started back in 2012. It's a demonstration program, but it has continued to grow. Um, and when it first started, it was kind of hard to do because the rents are much lower in RAD than they are when you go to the Section 8 platform. They've done some things that have made it a little bit more creative today. 
This is a little bit about RAD. It was created to give us a tool to preserve and improve public housing and address the multi-billion dollar backlog across the country of deferred maintenance. So this just kind of shows you um, what's happened in RAD since the beginning of time. There's been over a million public housing, there's a million public housing units nationwide. Um, as of last year, about 157 of them had converted to RAD already and about another, another 180,000 were in the process. So about 34% of the public housing across the country has already or is in the process of converting to RAD. What RAD actually does is it allows us to go out and leverage private debt and equity. Right now, if we needed to fix up a public housing property, we could not go out and borrow any money. We couldn't do tax credits. We couldn't put any kind of debt. Public housing statutorily is prohibited from having any debt put on it. So by taking those public housing units out of the public housing program and moving them to the Section 8 platform, we can now go out and secure private equity and debt. And so that's what HUD wants us to do. They want us to go out into the private market and get private capital to maintain these properties in the future. So that's the main thing that RAD does. It moves it to the Section 8 platform with long-term contracts, so it still protects the asset to assure that it's going to continue to be affordable. It's uh, basically the, the Section 8 contracts are perpetual. Um, there's a RAD use agreement that requires you to renew the contract. It's for 20 years, and then it renews for 20 years after, every time thereafter. The, re the residents benefit because if you're going to redevelop a property under RAD, number one, it's a one-for-one -one replacement, so you can't lose any units. And number two, the tenants have a guaranteed right to a, a unit in the project without being rescreened. So it protects the tenants throughout the process as well. They continue to pay 30% of their income. Um, it maintains the public stewardship because the property has a, a controlling interest either by a public body or a nonprofit entity. So it makes sure that they continue to do that. And basically what it does is it's more cost effective because it shifts the public housing to the Section 8 platform. And as I just mentioned, historically, Congress has always funded the Section 8 programs at a much higher level than what they fund public housing at. So that's the purpose of RAD and some of the benefits of it. The downside of RAD is that it didn't come with any new money. It came with the existing money. And so one of the challenges with RAD has been that the rents are lower than what they would be if you had just a straight Section 8 rent. Because what HUD did is they took the public housing money, which right now in public housing, the tenant pays a rent, we get operating funds from HUD, and we get capital funds. We don't know how much those operating funds and capital funds are each year because they're based solely on congressional appropriations. And as I mentioned, Congress tends to appropriate less money into public housing. But what happens is, is whatever we got for public housing converts over to Section 8, and it becomes the Section 8 rent for that property. So you still have the tenant rent, but then the operating and capital funds become the money that's available for the housing assistance payment. So the rents tend to be a little bit lower because it's based on public housing funding. And so HUD looked at that and they said, okay, there's a lot of people that can't do RAD because the rents are too low to support the amount of debt that's needed to rehab the property or to replace the property. So now they've come up with some other tools that they've given us that help us deal with some of that. So the next one I'm gonna talk about is section 18. Y'all are somewhat familiar with Section 18 because Swanson Homes, we used Section 18 obsolescence to be able to get that out of the public housing inventory. So you all have done some Section 18 in the past. So Section 8 disposition you can do for multiple reasons now. In the past, you could only do it for obsolescence, and that's what we used for Swanson Homes. But now they've expanded Section 18, and they're letting you use it for other things. So you could go in and say, I can operate this property much more effectively and efficiently if I convert it to a Section 8 platform. Because mm -hmm. as public housing, I don't have enough money to operate it and take care of the repairs. If I operate it as project-based vouchers, I'm going to generate more revenue, I can support some debt to fix it up, and I'm going to be able to um, maintain the property better. So when we do that, we basically submit a Section 18 application to the SAC, and we basically put, the, we receive tenant protection vouchers, new vouchers from HUD. We don't use our existing, HUD gives us new vouchers. And then the tenants have the option of taking that voucher and moving elsewhere or staying on the property because we're going to put project-based vouchers on those properties. But we've now increased the revenue by about probably 60% on that property. In public housing, we might have been getting $700. When we get that project-based voucher, we're probably getting closer to $1,400 or $1,500. We actually increased it probably 50%. 60%. So what we're looking at right now is Westbury Holly and Westbury Pine. 
we're looking at taking those properties into HUD under a Section 18 more effective and more efficient. That would be our MTW goal because we'll be able to do two things. We'll be able to go in and get it out of the public housing program, determine if we wanna put any debt on it, but then we'll also be able to use MTW funds to support it, even though, because we're MTW. Once you take these out of public housing without being MTW, you have no other funds that you can use because they become private. But we'll be able to continue to use MTW black grant funds to support the properties if we need to do that. So we're looking at wanting to put those in basically section 18 disposition. The next thing I want to talk about then is voluntary conversion because it's really the easy one. When you get down to less than 250 units, you can just go into HUD and say, you know what, I want to get out of this public housing program and I just want to convert these units. No reason, no nothing. You just say you want to do it. So we're looking at taking Seaboard 1 and 2 and Westbury Cottages because it gets us under the 250 units and being able to go in under what HUD calls a streamlined voluntary conversion. When we do that, we tell them we're going to exit the public housing program. It has a very simplified process that we have to go into HUD. The same thing happens. We get tenant protection vouchers and we put project-based vouchers at the property. We've now increased the revenue on those properties by 60, 50, 60%. And that's what we do. So that's really, as we've analyzed the remaining of our portfolio and we've moved to MTW, that's really what we're looking at wanting to do with the remaining properties so that we can exit the public housing program. Our goal is to make this happen by the end of this year. Um, and so that's pretty aggressive, but we're going to work on it and see if we can make that happen. So that's kind of where we are with our real estate portfolio. And that's it. I've talked enough. I'll try not to keep you longer. <laughs> Thank Commissioners, you. That's, that's like drinking from a fire hose. <laughs> <laughs> it's no doubt about it. As, as y'all saw, and we talked about a little bit uh, this afternoon, this is really exciting stuff. Uh, financially, there's some good implications to that. Administratively on the staff, there's good implications in it. For the tenants, which is what we're all focused on, it gives them that that hope, all right, of breaking that cycle of, hey, I'm not gonna be penalized for six years all right, if my income goes up and I have control over my rent. So I'm not saying this is easy. By any means am I saying this is easy, but if our goal is to improve the quality of life of our tenants, those that wish to take advantage of this, whether it's to, you know, to be in control of their rent or to buy a house or to get a, a, you know, a better education or a better job, there's now better hope than we've ever had before. The other thing is, is we have to be realistic <laughs> about brick and mortar public housing. You know, we're, 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 we're going to be, the, the funding is not going to be, it's just not there. As, as Cindy said, it's been cut back, cut back over, over a number of years. We see that happening even more. Now, we got, we qualified for these programs because you all are a high performer. We qualified for this program from the latest statistics, we've got 25 out of 25 out of our financial statistics. That means Hey, we're cooking with grease, all right? And, and they're trying to throw the incentives at us. You know, this MTW program wasn't given to, this opportunity was not given to every public housing in the United States. We're one of the very few to select. So we, you know, not that we have to make it work. We're going to make it work because, hey, this team can do it. So I'm excited about it. You know, we, we've, we've talked about four, four properties that we're going to have to do some refinancing on. So there's going to, you know, we as commissioners are going to have to get real smart or hopefully, uh, you know, board members being added, you know, that have banking backgrounds. But it, it, that part, you're going to see a lot more, a lot more implications on the financial side, right? So, Cindy, thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Uh, any, any, again, any. So, so now that I beat this dead horse, but uh, every so often, <laughs> again, I want us to come back, you know, and talk red and MPW, right? Because it is, it's, it's where we're going. Yeah. Ed, any more? Yeah. Uh, no, um, I think. Um, it's going to help us uh, going forward in the future. Um, we have a we have Stephanie, our new commissioner. Um, what do you think? It's the way to go. There are agencies across the nation that are definitely rolling into MTW. Um, I think it's a plus for the families. I think it's <laughs> so. The end game is to certainly secure our participants in terms of housing assistance, home ownership whatever it is, but it's also a benefit to us as a public housing agency in terms of how we can now work recertifications and interims and, and all of that. So it does take 
and relieve some of the stress from the staff. So being an end user of that, I know exactly how that feels. So I know it's going to be a plus for the staff. So yeah, I'm all for it. Great. All right. Thank you very much. Cindy, thank you very much. Appreciate it, ma'am. And you can stay if you want to and uh, listen to all this uh, good news that we're going to be talking about here. I'm probably going to let y'all go. Thank you. <laughs> good to see you all in person again, finally, after all this time. Thank, thank you. Very much. Cindy, thank you very much for taking us down this journey. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I don't have a lot of remarks. The uh, only one is, of course, I've asked Mr. Bland, and, and again, we have conversations probably uh, six times a week about security and safety in our buildings, but we did have a drive-by at, uh, at Lexington on uh, Saturday. Uh, I, I don't have the details, nor, nor you know, the police will get to us when they get to us, but we did have a, one of our residents uh, shot right in Lexington, so uh, we'll, more, more to come. but. Uh, you know, it'd been pretty quiet uh, for a lot for a while. Uh, you know, and I, and I, as a tribute to the again the leadership for keeping their finger on the pulse. Uh, I'm, I'm impressed. You know, we have the armed security uh, that we've had to bring on board. Uh, we've made real efforts on getting out to the, the uh, supervisors, getting out to the tenants. We've had uh, a lot of work over there at Dale and Lexington on trash pickup and trying just to trying to improve at least the, the physical environment. But uh, this one here, I guess we'll hear more as the as, as the. Uh... Do I have to? OK, let me go back to it. <laughs> <laughs> right. I'm oh, sorry. Yeah, I, I was just going to piggyback on that. As for all the issues that we've had in, in the in our facilities, drive bys, we have no power over. Right. So I just want to put that out there that it is what it is. Unfortunate as it is, uh, there was there's pretty much nothing that we could do. All right, Mr. Blaine brought to my attention that I did jump the gun there, and uh, I, I need to uh, uh, have the uh, resolution uh, 2020, 20, 2022-24 approval and the moves, moving the word supplement. This is the uh, discussion that uh, the 22 sides of Cindy went over. Uh, whereas the uh, Portsmouth Redevelopment Housing Authority was notified on uh, May 6th that it was selected for admission uh, to the Moving to Work Demonstration Program Cohort 2, uh, rent reform to study step rent and whereas participation in the moving to work demonstration requires a moving to work supplement to the annual agency plan and that's what we have in in the plan uh, whereas prha posted the draft mtw to the agency plan and we had we've had public comments and public <coughs> hearings on on both and there be resolved that the board commissioners uh, redevelopment housing authority do hereby approve the moving to work supplement as attached here to and authorizes as the secretary of the board of commissioners to execute the NTW certifications of compliance. I need a motion to approve the moving to work. I'd like to make a motion to uh, approve resolution 2022-24. Thank you, Mr. Second. Thank you. Second. Thank you, Commissioner Pickens. Okay, Ms. Uh, Marshall. Commissioner Koss. Yes. Commissioner Pickens. Yes. Commissioner Prince. Yes. Commissioner Witt. Yes. Yeah. Commissioner Wright. Vice Chair Jiggett. Yes. Chair Lalonde. Yes. At this point in our uh, in our uh, agenda, we have the uh, we've set aside time at every one to have our two any one of our two council liaisons to make their comments. Uh, as of course, you all know, Vice Mayor Barnes and Councilman Battle are two liaisons. So we've always offered them the opportunity to speak uh, on whatever remarks they had. So I just <clears throat> note that neither one of them are here. Uh, then from here, we go to the committee remarks. Uh, uh, Mr. Pickens, if okay, I'll take the uh, finance committee. Yes, sir. Right, right ahead. Uh, uh, I guess about uh, five, six days ago, the uh, chief financial officer, uh, uh, Kente Dabo, uh, submitted his resignation to the uh, to the Fort Rebellion uh, Housing Authority. Uh, uh, just to note, as as members of the finance commission, commissioners, and and of course, chairman of the board. Uh, Mr. Bland, we, we do view with absolute concern the loss of the CFO, uh, and I hope that you move with all due diligence to fill that position. Uh, you know, our two, our biggest, besides the oversight and hiring of the executive director, our responsibility is about the financials, and without having financials to go over, it's it's hard to t talk about the uh, the health, the financial health of the organization. Uh, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm going to push to you that we must have in our hands by the next board meeting financials. And uh, I know I know you've, you've 
I know you will get a plan to get it together. Just keep us all informed, mm -hmm. particularly Mr. Pickens and myself, so we can uh, offer any assistance to you. We will, but uh, this this board, this board, this the staff, and you have worked so hard to get our finances. Done. Just had a great presentation on MTW and Red, and we got there because we know what we're doing with the finances. So. Uh, we just implore you to move as, as, as you know, and I'm not saying necessarily quickly, but as efficiently and effectively as we can to bring a, bring a member of the team before. Okay. okay. All right, sir. All right, development committee. I don't know who's going to take that. Ms. Cost, okay, you got it. And, you, and again, as I've offered Ms. Wright, right. the opportunity to work with you. Okay. Then you got emails. Okay, good. Okay. <laughs> okay, the capital improvement uh, projects are being completed this month. To include the perimeter fixing at Lexington Place, new roof HVAC, water heaters at Westbury, and bathroom repairs at Seaport Square. The flooring at Westbury highly square is ongoing, and we are preparing for additional improvements for the fall. Work has also started and ongoing for six projects in the senior housing home, um, senior home program, repair program. The work is being scheduled through the summer and should be completed by August 2022. And everything else is closed session. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Cost. And thank you. Right. Human resources. I'm going to defer to uh, Mr. Bland in regards to when the uh, book will be out okay. for us. However, uh, with human resources being an issue in regards to our new hire, uh, when he gets back, I, I would like to request a meeting for us to discuss that. Okay, okay. The, the new HR hire? HR hire and okay. change, okay. HR issues. Got, got but in, in regards to that, we are finished officially, but uh, okay. with the preliminary time. book, it's got to come out for you guys. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, housing? Ms. Cross or Ms. Commissioner? Ms. Commissioner. Chair. Wicks. Yeah. Who's going to take it? I'm okay. sorry. Um, okay. Our report is as follows um, The Housing Choice Voucher Program is continuing to work our mainstream family unification and emergency housing voucher holders in their search for housing. We are continuing to update household and income information for voucher issuance to the Swanson residents that have selected to receive a tenant protection voucher for relocation. The housing department is continuing to assist the residents with their delinquent rental accounts through the Virginia Rental Relief Program, RRP, gov to go and payments are being received on the rent residents' behalf. Also, the wait list for Fever Square One, one-bedroom apartments, Dale, two-bedroom apartments, and Hope Village, two- and three-bedroom apartments was closed on April 20th, 2022. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. And just to reiterate, for us, because this is so important because council, we don't want it to come back to council that units will be held and correct me if I'm wrong, if I'm saying it wrong, uh, directors for those in Swanson homes who decide with their voucher they want to stay in Portland. Am I saying that right? So we're only holding up units for residents that do not want the voucher. Okay. But also, they can't push the shelves if they couldn't find something. We can house them until they find something with their voucher. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right. That's very important. Yeah. Thank you. The time. <coughs> the voucher time frame. We've been extending. Yes. Say that again. As well, they extend the voucher time frame. The search. The time they have to find something. To find something. Okay. And all that is good. Because once again, we don't want it to come back to council. Thank you. Mr. Blaine, we're going to backtrack and go back to your resources. Uh, Mr. Prince said you had some you had some conversation. Yeah, I was just saying that I don't know where you were with the uh, handouts, the booklets. Um, however, uh, one caveat I do I would like to set up a meeting between us two in regards to um, hiring of HR. Not that I'm involved in that, but just discussion in regards to that. This is great bedtime reading if you guys have nothing else to do. I'll say that right now. Do we need a new plan? That's it. Everybody got one. All right. <laughs> On governance, we we haven't had an official meeting, but uh, just to. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm sorry, Mr. Blaine. Oh, the handout F 
Councilman, take your time to read the but I would like to be able to come back to the board, at least I I'm going to say by uh, the September board meeting for final approval of the human of the uh, of the, of the uh, human resource uh, personnel uh, book that you, that you have. So you could kind of go through it, mark it up. Uh, now, uh, and the committee was, went through it. Yeah, I was going to say uh, for our attorney, how do we should any response to changes, questions, and addresses <clears throat> go individually or connect to both of us? Go to both of you. Well, just to make sure that. I'm sorry, I'm not sure. For the rest of the board, with their com uh, comments, uh, changes, what have you, for this book, mm -hmm. should it come to both of us as the committee or one of us? I just don't want to make. I don't want to make sure that we're not doing a meeting that's not a meeting. What you, what you can do, I think, is simply if you haven't come to me, then I can forward it to you. Uh, if you have any comments on the book, just uh, uh, email it to me, then I can CC. I can forward it to the committee. Okay. Yeah. I just want to make yeah. sure. Right. Yeah. Okay. Back to governance. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry, Mr. Bland. I oh, keep on no, cutting. No, no, go, go ahead, sir. Go ahead, sir. Go ahead. No, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about governance. Uh, I just wanted to say that um, I probably I sent the um, the old corporate agreement and the draft to the city manager, so I probably got to reach out to the acting city manager now to start that process all over again bring them up to speed because I know that uh, 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 the chair and vice chair asked that we kind of move on that. I did send the old one from 50, 54 if I remember. I would say wait till the 22nd because we have the new one on the 22nd. Yeah. Okay. Wait till the new city manager goes. Okay. But yeah. speaking of governance, to add to that, um, we can use the same process for the approval of the bylaws and resend them to each commissioner so that um, at our meeting in no later than August, we can adopt the revised bylaws. Is that uh, acceptable with you, Mr. Land? Something to cheat. Did, did we well, you had sent it out once to everybody. The, yeah, the bylaws, I did send them out. You did send them out, but I think you might want to send them again to the did, commission. Did, did you got revise, a new commission. Bylaws, it, it, was, it was just a draft that went. Yeah, yeah. it's a draft that will go to everybody. Okay. Here. Right. And then if any other commissioners have some suggestions, if you would email the suggestions to Mr. Bland, and then at the, we'll say the August meeting, we'll be able to um, adopt the revised bylaws. But I, in, under Robert's rules, um, we can at any time, we can make changes to our bylaws. We don't have to wait to make changes. So if we adopt these bylaws and then a month from now, two months, someone has a concern and wants to add something, that's okay. We'll just come back and you can just update the bylaws again. It, it, it takes a vote, but you're right, we, we do that. And I yeah. concur with that, considering we have a new commissioner. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah. Run, run those by me, let's take a look. Yeah, that would be okay. Yeah, but, but uh, if we can, send the bylaws out again to all the commissioners and then be ready to discuss at the August meeting for adoption. And don't feel like it's etched in stone, but you can always let's, make let's, a decision. Uh, right. August is plain. Yeah. You think it's plain? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And uh, again, in conjunction with the uh, governance, uh, we've got our, our required annual meeting next August. Uh, in August. Uh, September. 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 Okay. September. In September, where you will be uh, uh, electing or electing uh, chairman, vice chairman. All right. And also, if you don't mind, if you could bring to the table, if you want to make any changes to the committees that you're on, right? If you feel, hey, I've, I've enjoyed development. I'd like to learn something a little bit about this because uh, I really, I don't know about y'all, I really enjoy that we're, we're getting a chance to meet the staff, work with the staff, and be able to dig a little bit deeper than discussing it all at this meeting about what's going on. So thank you. So if you not, not to put anybody on the in the spotlight, but are our chair and the vice chair still going to be willing to accept by then or are we stepping down so that we all know if we want to step up or I'm stepping down. I I asked um, not to be reappointed. So my last meeting will be in August. Okay. Because that's when my term is up. But that's such a reappointment as commissioner. Right. Well that would also yeah, that would also say she wouldn't be she wouldn't be here for 
Yeah, yeah. I don't want to be appointed as a commissioner. Of course, I, I'm going to go with you all, but I would appreciate the opportunity to continue to serve the capacity. Just gives us an idea of where you're going Yeah, to you know, and I don't have any problem. I, they've known for a while, but I said, well, wait till it gets close to the end of my term, which is August. And um, not that you all have not been great, because you have. I've enjoyed it. But um, if uh, some of you recall, I was on Economic Development Authority Commission before I came on here. So I just need a break. I just need a break. So, right. Um, right. Explain your up. Um, well, we went to, uh, um, some of us went to uh, San Antonio, Texas for a final conference. Um, we learned a lot. Uh, we got to see the, the city and, <laughs> and Riverwalk and whatever else like that. Um, and we had some commissioner, I think Commissioner Wick is going to New Orleans for the um, CERC conference and we had some staff going. They're mm -hmm. leaving for Saturday or Sunday? Saturday. Saturday. Um, and I hope you have as much fun as I did not in San Antonio. <laughs> 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 Let's just say it was a very interesting. <laughs> we had fun. It was educational across the board. <laughs> uh, and we have all the conferences coming up. Uh, I'll get you a list so you have it. So uh, look at 2022-2023 uh, and, and let us know if, what you're planning to uh, attend so that we can uh, uh, make sure that we get you in, into the host hotel and stuff like that. Um, and what I try to do is send me stuff out from time to time in between the meetings. Um, and that is basically is all I have. Now, I will close Monday uh, for uh, Juneteenth, uh, the 19th, where uh, office will be closed. And the other piece is staff is working very hard um, trying to make sure we're meeting all the needs that the residents have, maintenance wise, and other issues. Um, we we have cameras in most of our developments and we have got a grant in uh, for additional uh, security fence and stuff like that. And I think we're probably going to get that. We submitted a grant for close to 250,000, I believe. Uh, so once we get that, then we will really be in a situation where we have cameras and stuff in all of our communities that will kind of help. And I will say that the cameras have not solved all of our problems, but the cameras definitely have reduced some of the activity in some of the communities. So, People know that the cameras are out there, and we can look at the cameras to determine uh, what units are the problems and things like that. You said security fence. Look. Well, we're looking at maybe putting a decorative fence in front of seaboard, or uh, where you know a nice decorative fence in front of seaboard, mm -hmm. and one also in front of Hamilton on Turnpike, so it it give me some character to those two communities. And then we're looking at maybe putting some cameras in the Westbury communities, uh, exterior, interior wise. Uh, um, um, and like I said, the cameras have helped, have not solved all the um, negative activity, but they have reduced a lot of negative activity because the families realize now that the cameras can kind of tell us what's happening with that. It's not perfect, but it has it helped. Uh, and we've been fortunate enough to get, get grant money to go ahead and do that. The cameras that we put at uh, our last three community we put the cameras in, we, the city, uh, Made a commitment. We put the cameras in, and we're going to get reimbursed from the city. That was in Hamilton. Hamilton, Lexington, and Dade. Yeah. So, so they are reimbursing. Yeah, they, they will be reimbursing. When will they, that they, happen? They will be. Yeah. 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 That's yeah. That's yeah. That's yeah. And I love you too. <laughs> I love you too. That's what I'm asking. Yeah. Right? Well, yeah. What's the What's the date? Uh, there's no date. There's no date. Will be. By July one. Uh, the new fiscal year. Well, I got to. Well, no, I got to get all with the new city. Huh? Make that happen. <laughs> it was a, it was a commitment made, and I think in writing. Let's, let's yeah. wait post June 22. <laughs> so I think we will. Okay, I have, I have one other question. When is this fence going to get fixed? I'm sorry, your, what? The fence here. Uh, Clarity begins at home. Well, when what, is this fence uh, going to get fixed? What is happening? Uh, we have reached out to the vendor. Uh, materials are, are constantly on back order. The, um, and uh, so we're still waiting for the materials to come in um, mm -hmm. uh, so we can repair the fence. Uh, that's where we are now. Wait yes. for the material. To yeah, come in fact, in. Uh, the last checked uh, about a week ago and still wait for the material to come in for that. Okay. Yeah. Mr. Chair, can I piggyback? Oh, sir, the, please, uh, please. Conferences. Please. Uh, I, I just want to say after a half dozen conferences, um, for any commission that hasn't been, go at least to one. Uh, this one in particular, as with uh, Arizona, 
I think this board and this PRHA in particular is way beyond uh, many in the region, if not the, the country in regards to uh, thinking outside the box. A lot of this conference was about uh, not getting caught up into political stuff, as well as um, what the boards can do to um, help promote positive in the PRHA. And I, I think that we are there. Um, obviously, with the current atmosphere, everybody has a long way to go, but I, I, I would like to commend um, this board of commissions and PRHA for doing a wonderful job at keeping the focus on the residents that we serve. Um, and I'm glad to be a part for however long that I'm at with this PRHA. And with that in mind, uh, again, uh, and I appreciate it's a great lead into mm -hmm. the resolution that we have. Uh, one of the, uh, you know, the things I put down was I wanted to, those commissioners and Ms. Wright down from board is there is a certification process to be a certified commissioner. And uh, that can only happen if you attend a lot of these conferences and the educational that they do at the conferences. So Mr. Bland uh, has uh, got a resolution proposed about the finance required to pay for us to go to those meetings. Mr. Bland, I'll take it, I'll give it to you. And with that, uh, it's res resolution 2022-25, resolution authorizing approval of budget allowance for the Board of Commissioners uh, to attend housing industry. Uh, before we had a budget allowance of 5,000 uh, per okay. commissioner. We, have increased that to 9,000 because you know everything has gone up. Uh, hotels gone up, uh, gas has gone up. So with that, we figured the 9,000 would give you an opportunity to go to these three conferences uh, a year, unless things just keep going up. Uh, so that that's uh, so that resolution is to uh, take the present uh, allotment from five to nine. Okay. All right, so uh, I need uh, a motion for resolution 20. Uh, first of all, any discussion at all on that resolution from you, commissioners? All right. Uh, as Ed said, uh, you know, I would target three. It was my recommendation. The Virginia Housing Conference, Virginia Governor's Housing Conference is one that you ought to go to, mm -hmm. and that's usually here locally. Then there's a regional housing conference. Uh, there, the uh, HUD region director came here just the other day. He's got Pennsylvania, Maryland, Virginia. Uh, it, it's important that we know what's happening in our region and then select one of the other national conferences, whether it be a commissioner's conference or a national housing conference. But uh, as a minimum, if you can't travel that far, at least go to the ones locally, right? And I'd like to make a resolution for 2022-25 right. to be accepted. However, I would ask that there be something sent out to all the commissioners in regards to the certification. So that we're clear on how we can do that good. and and what we need to do. Very good. I have a motion on your second. Yep, Miss Wicks. Thank you, Miss Miss Clark. Commissioner Potts. Yes. Commissioner Pickens. Yes. Commissioner Prince. Yes. Commissioner Wicks. Yes. Commissioner Wright. Yes. Vice Chair Jiggett. Yes. Chair Lulani. Yes. All right. Uh, we're going to uh, before we go into uh, closed session. Uh, public speakers uh, in the community are allowed up to five minutes to speak uh, at one of these PRT meetings. And do we have any visitors or I don't see anybody on, uh, on unavailable online. So uh, we're going to read resolution 2022-26 to move us into closed session, whereas the Freedom of Information Act provides the Board of Commissioners can meet in a closed meeting for discussion of the disposition of publicly held property where discussion in an open meeting would adversely affect the bargaining position or negotiating strategy of the public body as set forth in section 2.2-3711 of the Code of Virginia as amended for matters uh, for discussion or disposed of properties located in downtown, Old Town, Prentice Place, Lincoln Park, and Churchland. Now therefore be resolved in a compliance with the uh, uh, Virginia Board of Information Act and above for reference section of the Virginia Code the Board of Commissioners shall reconvene in a closed meeting on June 16th today for discussion of publicly held property. So I need a motion and a vote. So move. Second. Good. Ms. Marshall. Commissioner Cross. Yes. Commissioner Pickens. Yes. Commissioner Prince. Yes. Commissioner Wicks. Yes. Commissioner Wright. Yes. Vice <coughs> Chair Jiggett. Yes. Chair Lalonde. Yes. Uh, we are in closed motion. Thank you. Mm -hmm.